This is the World Report of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, October 2022. Coming up, culture, service, and heritage. Students celebrate their roots while forging their futures. In the shadow of conflict, refugees find shelter for their families and inspiration for their spirits. But first, after 48 years, the newly renovated Washington, D.C. Temple opens its doors to the public and is rededicated. They offer light in an ever-darkening world, a refuge from life's storms. Temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints help devout members grow closer in faith to God and Jesus Christ and join families together for eternity. Since its beginnings, the restored Church of Jesus Christ has actively sought to build temples as taught in the scriptures. While Sunday worship services are held in meeting houses, temples are the only place where the highest sacraments of the faith can be performed. In recent decades, the church has embarked on a major undertaking to make worship in temples more accessible to people around the world. Plans to build 100 of these sacred spaces have been announced by Church President Russell M. Nelson in the last four years. But it's not the number, and it's not the location, and it's not the architecture. It's the ordinances inside, and each temple stands as a sacred step to eternal life for us and our families. Even as new temples are being constructed, the most iconic of the church's historic temples are being renewed and restored. Prior to temples being dedicated, people outside the faith have the chance for a never before seen look inside. As experienced at the Washington DC temple where nearly 350,000 visitors attended the open house. After four years of extensive renovation that left no room untouched, the Washington DC Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has reemerged, renewed, rejuvenated. Its doors open to the public to come and see before its rededication. As part of the public open house events, several members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles were on hand to guide 5,000 special guests and explain the meaning of worship in the temple. Visitors included prominent faith and government leaders, as well as local and international news organizations. If I heard the word welcome once, I heard it a thousand times today. It's amazing that how much in common we have is to have my LDS friends share with me part of the philosophy and the doctrine and the beauty of their church was just a wonderful experience. There are a lot of similarities uh, that go back to the Old Testament with Latter-day Saints and with Jews. Uh, and, and I could see that. Uh, I could really identify with many of, of your traditions. To Latter-day Saints, this gleaming sacred structure with its vertical design represents the purity and enlightenment of God, ever reaching heavenward. When you come here, you feel something very different than you feel anywhere else. The temple is very striking from the outside, and obviously the iconic view from the beltway, but much more impressive than the actual physical structures are what takes place inside. The Washington DC Temple is the first to be built by the church in the Eastern United States. The Washington DC Temple is an iconic landmark here in DC. So it's exciting now that we get to share that with our family and friends. To me, the word that uh, comes to mind is light. You just feel this sense of light and joy and presence in the spirit of the temple. Refurbished art glass behind the reception desk depicts the tree of life described in the Book of Mormon, representing eternal life and the love of God. The symbolism of light is also found on the exterior art glass at the main entrance and east and west towers. Coloration of the glass starts in a darker tone and goes up to the top of the spire. It's almost white, which really signifies kind of the ascension of light as we learn and grow to try to be more like our Heavenly Father. 
Images of Jesus Christ fill the halls of the temple, reminding guests that this is the house of the Lord. In the baptistry, following the Savior's commandment that all must be baptized, temple patrons can act on behalf of those who did not have the opportunity in this life by entering the waters of baptism in their place. A domed oval motif is seen in some of the ceiling rooms where marriages are performed that unite couples and their families together forever. In the instruction rooms, devout members learn about God's creation, the purpose of life, and how to become more like Him. The celestial room. Entering this sacred space symbolizes the ultimate progression one can achieve toward heaven itself. On August 14, 2022, the temple was rededicated by church president Russell M. Nelson. When you look at a temple, you should realize that it is a symbol of Jesus Christ as he is our mediator with the Father. Only by him and through him can we reach our Heavenly Father. Times are difficult and people are looking for hope. They're looking for a light. And so coming here reminds you of who you are and strengthens your resolve and helps brighten your light so that you can go be a light to others. It's also a place of peace where when we come, we can leave the world for the moment and just contemplate and pray to our Heavenly Father and receive revelation. So much of what happens in the temple is symbolic, but there is one thing that is absolutely literal, and it's written on the outside of every single temple, House of the Lord. This truly is Jesus Christ's house. Temple is my home, is my Father's home. In Japan, Latter-day Saints are also reflecting on the renovation of another historic temple, the Tokyo Japan Temple, the first to be built on the Asian continent. Tokyo Japan is the world's largest metropolis, home to more than 37 million people. The city is rich in history and tradition that goes back thousands of years, including its ancient temples and shrines. Japanese people are their temple-going people. It's just woven into their culture. It's part of their DNA. On a special day, they visit the temple or shrine. It has a striking similarity to what we, as Latter-day Saints, hold as one of our sacred rites and customs, as being able to go to the temple. In 1975, thousands were assembled when Church President Spencer W. Kimball made the announcement Japanese Saints had been praying for. We therefore propose to you assembled here that we build a temple in Tokyo, Japan for all of Asia. As I said, you're doing this is something that we treasure and we love to share the things that we treasure. From the moment you set foot on the temple grounds, a garden welcomes you with the sound of gentle flowing water. Natural stones, surrounded by delicate vegetation, give you a place to sit and ponder where you are almost taken back in time by original Ishidoro lanterns. As you enter the temple, the feeling of quiet elegance invokes a sense of reverence. Exquisite materials and refined furnishings help visitors focus their thoughts on spiritual matters. Traditional art pieces depict nature, a contemplation of God's awe-inspiring power and goodness. The pine tree in Japanese culture symbolizes eternal life. We feel a closeness, a kinship with our ancestors when we enter temples and participate in the ordinances that take place there. The bridal room is where women can dress in preparation for the eternal marriage ordinance known as a ceiling. The decor was inspired by traditional kimono patterns as seen in the elegant carpet design. The experience in the temple culminates inside the celestial room. There's a sacred, reverent feeling in the celestial room. 
It's a place where we can contemplate and silently pray. It's a very personal experience. The Tokyo Japan Temple was rededicated in July by President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency. Across the world in Brazil, more than 45,000 church members living in Rio de Janeiro awaited with great anticipation the dedication of this new Christian landmark. Brazil is a melting pot. We have people from all over the world and they always are welcome. And as a beacon of hope, the massive Christ the Redeemer statue stands as a symbol to the city and its people. The image of the Savior is a symbol of his love to everybody. He has his arms extended to everybody who comes to the city. And then the temple is a second witness of that love because it is through the temple and its ordinances that love is manifested. Elder Ulysses Suarez of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and his wife Rosanna, both from Brazil, participated in the temple's public open house. Eu acho muito importante e maravilhoso porque nós nos conhecemos aqui no Rio de Janeiro e também servimos missão aqui no Rio de Janeiro em ver o progresso. We always dreamed with the temple, but we could never imagine that in such a time that blessing would become available to our people. Muitos amigos, muita gente interessada perguntando quem é esse edifício tão bonito aqui, o que é que vai ter aqui dentro, né? É o lugar mais sagrado da Terra, é o lugar mais especial. Eu imagino e desejo de todo o coração que ao entrar na casa do Senhor, essas milhares de pessoas que virão aqui possam sentir a importância que Deus tem na nossa vida. The Rio de Janeiro Brazil Temple was dedicated on May 8th by Elder Gary E. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Coming up. The Church's For the Strength of Youth program expands, providing fun and faith to youth around the world. And later, you'll get an in-depth look at a critical moment of the Salt Lake Temple's renovation. This experience is about your identity, about your heritage, about your ancestors. Cultural understanding, Religion, language, and the arts are just a few of the things students from the Amos C. Brown Fellowship got to experience on their recent trip to Ghana. The fellowship is a collaboration between the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the NAACP, designed to help American students of various backgrounds experience Ghanaian culture, learn about their ancestral heritage, and become ambassadors of racial harmony. The fellowship was created in honor of the Reverend Dr. Amos C. Brown. Dr. Martin Luther King said, there will never be a fellowship until all the fellows are in the ship. Welcome home. It's Cameroon! While there, many of the fellows were able to trace their family lines to West African villages. To me, it symbolizes like the beginning of who I am, because now I feel like I have like a, a place of origin. So we're excited to be part of this, a big part of our initiative to follow President Nelson's counsel to root out racism, to come to understand the horrific situations throughout our history that not only need to be rectified, but to learn of them, to make sure they're never repeated. To make sure African American youth understand in this first ever fellowship to Ghana, the 81-year-old Reverend Brown articulates the spiritual foundation to overcoming the politics of divisiveness and the long-term value in loving our neighbor. The more we get together, the happier we will be. If we would only say, we are family. From India to Africa, and from Mexico to San Diego, this year, a record 200,000 teens are attending For the Strength of Youth conferences to learn about Jesus Christ and His Gospel. The Youth Conference is known as FSY and is sponsored by the church. 
After a pause during the pandemic, FSY is returning in several countries and is expanding to several others, including the United States, Canada, and Kenya. This year's theme is Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all our heart. What are some times that you've seen in your life where you've received answers through the scriptures? Like there's like just reading the scriptures. During the week-long conference, teens immerse themselves in studying the scriptures and gospel principles while learning how to apply them in their lives, all with a youthful twist. The activities include equal parts class time and wholesome fun. FSY is modeled after EFY, another youth program affiliated with Brigham Young University. But in an effort to reach more youth, the church is fully adopting FSY and subsidizing the cost of attendance. Very grateful to be here. It's been an amazing experience. It's about opening doors for one another so someone else can enter. Members of the New York Commission of Religious Leaders visited Utah in mid-June. New York is one of a kind, and to have these strong religious communities in there and then having them figured out how to get tied together, this is a great example of a group that's figured out how to do that. The church has grown it, raised it, produced it, canned it. The interfaith leaders made several stops on their visit, including Welfare Square, the Family History Library, and a meeting with the First Presidency on Temple Square. I'm so blown away right now, just moving over the crowd. I don't think there's been one stop that hasn't been absolutely emotional for me. I have been crying on every turn because it is so embodied in God's love. Concluding their visit, the New York delegation traveled to the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo, where they joined with Elder Quentin L. Cook for the Religious Freedom Annual Review. Four-term New York Attorney General Robert Abrams was honored in June with the Thomas L. Kane Award for his many years building bridges between the Jewish community and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I would never have dreamt that a young Jewish liberal lawyer uh, would one day be the recipient of such a wonderful award. Music has the power to heal the soul. That was the message church leaders shared when they virtually participated in the Amar Foundation-sponsored Windsor Dialogue Conference at London's Westminster Abbey. In every religion, certainly in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, music is a powerful, powerful force. The annual conference focuses on the causes, treatments, and cures for people displaced by religious persecution. In the summer of 2014, ISIS fighters and local collaborators attacked religious minorities living in northern Iraq. They have suffered so much and they need the healing and the resilience of their music. No religion that I know of doesn't pray while singing. There are 80 million refugees globally. We're determined to do something about that. In April, Amar Foundation Chairman Baroness Emma Nicholson visited Salt Lake City, Utah, where she got to experience the power of music firsthand by singing in the tabernacle at Temple Square. We actually sat in those famous choir seats, and we actually sang. I'm not quite sure it was quite as good as the choir, and we had the real organist playing for us. When we come back, President Nelson holds a special devotional and shares guiding insights with young adults. Seek answers with a fervent desire to believe. And a new monument brings representation and honor to the first black pioneers. More than 24,000 young adults poured into the conference center of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in downtown Salt Lake City, Sunday, May 15th. I saw that he was going to be talking about the future, and I definitely want some guidance for mine. During an hour-long devotional, which was broadcast to young adults around the world, President Russell M. Nelson and his wife Wendy shared messages specific to this time in the lives of young men and women. 
Seek answers with a fervent desire to believe. Learn all you can about the gospel and be sure to turn to truth-filled sources for guidance. President Nelson encouraged the university-age audience to live their best lives. Know the truth about who you are. It was the first time in at least two years that young adults were invited to gather on historic Temple Square. I invite you to reclaim or to increase the sacred in your life. And I promise that your future will be more exhilarating than anything you can presently believe. In preparing for this talk, I have been blessed in understanding the worldwide importance of religious freedom. Rome, Italy is the site of the second annual Notre Dame Religious Liberty Summit at the historic Pontifical Gregorian University. <laughs> President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency gave the distinguished keynote remarks. When citizens learn to live together with respect, despite important religious differences, they're also more likely to live with others with whom they have important secular differences. President Oaks delivered powerful remarks today where he reminded us about the value of religious liberty. This is not a call for doctrinal compromises, but rather a plea for unity and cooperation on strategy and advocacy toward a common goal of religious freedom for all. To have someone of his stature lending his importance to the importance of this movement, I think is the, the greatest honor he could bestow on us. On the morning of a beautiful, clear spring day in Topsfield, Massachusetts, five generations of Smiths were honored at the dedication of a monument in their name. Joseph Smith, the first prophet of the restored Church of Jesus Christ, is a descendant of those who lived in this small, picturesque community just north of Boston from the 1600s through the late 1700s, including his father, Joseph Smith Sr. The Lord had his eye on the Smith family from the foundations of the creation of the earth. Now that's great. M. Russell Ballard, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and a great-great-nephew of Joseph Smith, dedicated the monument. While in New England, President Ballard also ministered to members of the church. I assure you that God has wonderful promises for you if you keep your faith. Speaking to youth, missionaries, leaders, and general church membership, Elder Ulysses Suarez of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles ministered in Australia and New Zealand in May. Accompanied by his wife, Rosanna, Elder Suarez also visited the construction site of the Auckland New Zealand Temple, the New Zealand Missionary Training Center, and the newly renovated Hamilton New Zealand Temple. An historic trip to Kazakhstan, Elder Ulysses Suarez addressed the Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions. Its purpose, to establish peace, harmony, and tolerance among all nations and peoples, while also achieving mutual respect and tolerance between religions to prevent the escalation of conflicts and hostilities. This is the first time a senior leader of the Church of Jesus Christ has participated at the Congress. The symposium was held in mid-September in the nation's capital of Nur Sultan. A coalition of charity, parliamentary, academic, and faith partners gathered in the United Kingdom for the conference Preventing Violence, Promoting Freedom of Belief, supported by the church. I find that when governments think about a multiplicity of religions really blessing their country, then they're more free in trying to make sure that everybody can follow the dictates of their own conscience. The church and its partners brought 19 global peace builders to the UK to share practical solutions at parliamentary and UK government meetings. The last time a senior leader of our church spoke at the press club was in 2000, President Gordon B. Hinckley. It's good to be back. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was the featured speaker of the National Press Club Headliners Luncheon held in May in Washington, D.C. 20 years ago, President Hinckley mentioned that the church completed 
829 humanitarian projects in 101 countries. Last year, that number was 3,909 projects in 188 countries. Elder Bednar spoke to more than 100 journalists about the church's humanitarian efforts, its commitment to education, and its mission to follow Jesus Christ. Sister Rasband and I have loved being here in Asia. Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles returned from a visit to Asia in the spring, marking the first time an apostle has visited the area since before the pandemic. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Joined by his wife, Melanie, Elder Rasband met with church members and missionaries in Singapore, New Delhi, and India, and held virtual meetings in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and Taiwan. Shortly after their ministry in Asia, the Rasbands traveled to the continent of Africa for a 10-day ministry. There, Elder Rasband met with Mozambique President Felipe Nayusi, marking the first time a senior church leader has met with a head of state from that country. This is the most important gift I could give to you, is this scripture which is so dear to my heart. In Kenya, Elder Rasband joined with Elder Joseph W. Satati of the 70 as they addressed the media at the construction site for the Nairobi Kenya Temple. Going forward, you'll be pleased with what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints can contribute to the society of Kenya. When I'm strong enough to fly, brave enough to fall, have energy to In celebration of the first pioneers to arrive in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847, President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles offered the dedicatory the prayer Melbourne for a new Valley. monument. The monument was unveiled at This is the Place Heritage Park in Salt Lake City. It honors the contributions of free and enslaved African-American pioneers who settled in Utah, including Green Flake, brothers Hark Wales and Oscar Smith, and Jane Manning James. To our black pioneer ancestors, we bring our peace, our reverence, our joy. This first group of pioneers in 1847 will never be forgotten. I have such great affection for all of our Heavenly Father's children. President Ballard was accompanied by fellow apostle Elder D. Todd Christofferson. It was powerful feeling that we all feel that. Now that everybody has the opportunity to know our history, um, it's awesome. The monument was made possible through private donations. It will serve as a place of learning, reflection, and healing. When we return, amid uncertainty and armed conflict, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf ministers to refugees in Poland. And donations of mobile kitchens, school supplies, and clean water bless countless lives. You are a light to many nations. You are the examples where people say, if they can do it, we can do it. In April, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, himself once a refugee, personally ministered to the people in Poland, forced to flee the armed conflict in Ukraine. We appreciate not only for some uh, things, for food and place uh, to live, but also we appreciate for any kind of word and any smile and any hug. Since the start of the armed conflict, congregations across Europe spent countless hours in service to displaced families. Full-time missionaries were reassigned to serve in reception hubs and shelters near the Ukrainian border. In Poland, Latter-day Saint congregations organized donation supply chains. A local church member from Lutsk, Ukraine, drove a supply van back and forth to a suffering country every week, and several families in Poland opened their homes to Ukrainian refugees. So the first, uh, I have something to eat for people and something to drink. And uh, then we are preparing the bed, the place, and then we just uh, welcome them, <laughs> feed them. It's a hard time for us, but uh, that is um, that is help uh, on for for my life. 
Across the world, including Western Canada, church members organized events to welcome refugees and partnered with interfaith groups to collect donations. To date, the church has donated more than 900 tons of food. More than one and a half million people in parts of Africa, the Caribbean, and the Middle East will receive food aid through the church's largest one-time humanitarian donation. In a ceremony held in Rome on September 14th, Bishop L. Todd Budge of the presiding bishopric presented a $32 million contribution on behalf of the church to executives of the World Food Program at their headquarters. In the coming months, this relief will be distributed across nine direly impacted countries with emphasis on their most vulnerable residents, including malnourished children and displaced households. The efforts of church members to strengthen communities are ongoing. The 2021 annual report provides new insight into humanitarian aid projects and service provided by Everyday Latter-day Saints, amounting to 6.8 million hours of community service in just one year and nearly $1 billion in monetary donations. These efforts have one goal, to improve the quality of life for all of God's children. Around the world, more than 600,000 students have better learning opportunities in communities like Palencia, Guatemala. Yeah. Here, elementary age kids are starting school with better nutrition, thanks in part to new cooking facilities. In July, three schools opened new kitchens, including these container units at two schools. The spaces are equipped with a stove, refrigerator, and clean running water to serve nearly 500 students. Previously, volunteer parents used improvised outdoor spaces. They warmed the children's lunches on makeshift wooden stoves. The principal at one school says that mothers lacked essentials like running water to wash fruits and vegetables. But that has all changed. Quiero en primer lugar agradecer a la Iglesia de Jesucristo de los Santos de los últimos días. La donación del contenedor, el cual va a funcionar como cocina para nuestro establecimiento. In Mozambique's Maputo province, hundreds of children no longer have to learn in dilapidated buildings or under shade trees because they have newly built classrooms. This project was made possible by a partnership between the church and the nonprofit organization No Poor Among Us. In northern Lebanon, 1,500 children were surprised to receive backpacks filled with school supplies as part of a back to school campaign. In Kenya, Students at the Mivendeni Primary Schools have new scriptures and classroom facilities. The school's student population of 1,700 is half Christian and half Muslim. The donations of Qurans and Bibles will enable Muslim students to learn Islamic teachings from the Quran, while Christian students are taught from the Bible. In Chiapas, Mexico, an 1,800-meter-long water pipeline extension is bringing clean drinking water to thousands of children living in the rural community of El Chanal and surrounding areas. In the past, running water was only available to these communities every two weeks. To make do, mothers walked for several hours to get water from a well. The project was made possible by the church, which donated materials and supplies to build the pipeline, and local community leaders who provided labor and manpower. More than 12,000 parents and children now have better access to water in their homes. 44 new temples are presently under construction. Coming up, we'll take you to the dedications, groundbreakings, and announcements of temples around the world. And later, a donation from the church provides for the manufacturing of wheelchairs in Guatemala. Forty-four new temples are presently under construction. More are being renewed. In the April 2022 General Conference, President Russell M. Nelson announced plans to construct 17 new temples around the world in Wellington, New Zealand, Brazzaville, Republic of the Congo, Barcelona, Spain, Birmingham, United Kingdom, Cusco, Peru, Maceo and Santos, Brazil, San Luis Potosi and Mexico City, Benemerito, Mexico, Tampa, Florida, Knoxville, Tennessee, Cleveland, Ohio, 
Wichita, Kansas, Austin, Texas, Missoula, Montana, Montpelier, Idaho, and Modesto, California. In addition to new temples announced, several temples have been dedicated. On May 22nd, the Zhigo Guam Temple was dedicated by Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the first temple built in the Micronesia Islands. In June, Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles dedicated the Praia Cape Verde Temple. Located about 350 miles off the coast of West Africa, the Cape Verde Islands are home to more than 15,000 members of the church. Also in June, after a major renovation, the Hong Kong Temple was rededicated by Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. The Hong Kong Temple was originally dedicated in 1996 by then-President Gordon B. Hinckley. In addition to dedications, since April, ground has been broken for temples in Bahia Blanca, Argentina, Grand Junction, Colorado, Linden, Smithfield, and Ephraim, Utah, Elko, Nevada, Burley, Idaho, Farmington, New Mexico, Yorba Linda, California, and Lumumbashi, Democratic Republic of the Congo. When we return, the Relief Society organization celebrates 180 years. The fourth season of the Book of Mormon video series shares the light of Christ's ministry in the Americas. And a new exhibit at the Church History Museum shares testimony through art. These stories and more in the news. The Relief Society organization of the church is celebrating its 180th anniversary. Women around the world commemorated the March anniversary by rendering service, including in Canterbury, England, where sisters Raina I. Aberto, formerly of the Relief Society General Presidency, and Michelle D. Craig of the Young Women General Presidency helped to assemble shelters for the homeless. These sisters are exemplifying the example of Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do, because we love Jesus Christ. A $5.1 million donation from the church is helping the American Red Cross better prevent and alleviate human suffering. The donation also supports the organization's Sickle Cell Initiative. The initiative raises awareness about sickle cell disease, which disproportionately affects African communities. 600 years from the time that we left Jerusalem, a prophet will the Lord God raise up among the Jews. The much anticipated fourth season of the Book of Mormon videos is coming soon. Nine new videos depict the Book of Mormon's crowning events with the Savior's ministry among the Nephites after his resurrection. Ye are they of whom I said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. A new video will be released each Friday throughout October and November. You can watch free of charge on the recently improved Book of Mormon app and on YouTube. An interfaith prayer service hosted by the church is becoming a yearly tradition in Peru. In July, the We Pray for Peru service was held for the second time. The nation's president joined faith leaders who prayed for economic stability the environment, and victims of COVID-19. This service was broadcast on national television. The nonprofit Transitions Foundation is better able to help people with specialized needs in Guatemala City. In June, the foundation received a new machine to manufacture prosthetics and wheelchairs, which was made possible by a donation from the church. The donation is also providing jobs for several machine operators who are able to manufacture locally. A variety of international art pieces are now on display at the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City, Utah. The pieces were received for the 12th International Art Competition. This year's theme, All Are Alike Unto God. It was exhilarating to see so much diversity in this art. The exhibit is open until April 2023. The 16th church historian and recorder of the church has started service. Elder Kyle S. McKay is entrusted is with preserving the church's history and documenting its present. And these things, the history, the things that we do help us know and remember who we are. In fact, that's one of the commandments God has given us is to remember. In this important responsibility, 
Elder McKay hopes to continue the church's efforts to be transparent with such projects as the Joseph Smith Papers and the four volume narrative history, Saints. It's one of the toughest jobs on site, manual digging with laser precision under millions of pounds of stone. Seismic upgrades are putting the renovation of the Salt Lake Temple on a sure foundation, one inch at a time. It's one of the grittiest jobs in construction and one of the toughest. We have to go up there and dig it all out. For more than eight hours a day, Miner Dakota Hansen toils in virtual darkness, and he does it in the confines of a four-foot diameter steel pipe underneath an estimated 187 million pounds of stone known as the Salt Lake Temple. Normally, we try to go about six feet a day. Dakota is part of a crew placing 96 of these pipes that range from 20 to 40 feet long under the original foundation of the temple. When enough earth and stone is removed, it's time to put the pipe into the area Dakota has mined. Hydraulic rams thrust this sled on tracks against the pipe and slowly push it into the hole with over 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. The process is called jack and bore, a key component in the seismic upgrade system for the temple. The jacking portion is the actual pushing of the pipe and the boring, um, typically these are done with a large bore. In this case, we're actually doing it all by hand uh, based on the accuracy that we need. The reason? These pipes tie into a very intricate system that secure the entire structure via cables, rods, trusses, and transfer beams from the spires and roof to the reinforced foundation to ensure that the building moves as one solid structure in an earthquake. The precision needed in the jack and bore process is very critical to a future component coming down from the roof, which is another set of uh, post-tension cables that are actually being drilled from the top of the spires all the way down right in between these jack and bore casings. This rebar cage is built off site and hefted into place with a crane. These inserts add more strength to support the weight of the temple. These ducts inside the cage will eventually house post tension cables to help suspend that weight. Through that pipe we have cabling and it's, it's somewhat draped like this and in the future when we tension it it's actually going to lift up and put pressure up against the pipe. Once the cages are inserted, a cap like this will be placed on the exterior and interior ends. In this step, grout is pumped into the steel pipe to capacity before being capped off. Once completed, the jack and bore process will bring the seismic upgrade of the temple one step closer to the next phase. And then as we excavate down and get lower, we'll install a big heavy concrete footing then the base isolators. 98 of these base isolators will rest below the jack and bore pipes and can support over 8 million pounds each, acting as bearings, keeping the temple secure in a high magnitude earthquake. And then on top of the isolators, we have the transfer beam that hooks the jack and bore system together. The giant reinforced transfer beams will be placed in these openings of the temple for additional strength and support. And all of that works as a whole system to create a new foundation for the temple. So it's absolutely critical part of that system. All this stuff coming in here right now is, is key to actually holding up the temple after all is said and done. It's one of the toughest jobs on site. Jack and bore crews dedicated to the difficult task. The historic implication is not lost on these men either, as they put in the long hours of labor to complete their part. This is a, an icon of the world. We want to make sure that it does not move ever. It's just a super unique project that we'll probably never see again. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it really is an honor to be on it. This has been the World Report for The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. October 2022. To watch the World Report online, visit newsroom.churchofjesuschrist.org. And to watch full-length versions of these stories, go to the Church Newsroom YouTube channel.